morning. And welcome to worship on this Palm Sunday, a welcome to all of our members, all of those who are visiting with us here today, as well as a welcome to those of you who are joining us by Facebook as well. We'll be following the order of service that is printed in the service bulletin, and our service begins with the responsive reading and the gospel reading here this morning as well. So the congregation is asked to please stand, and we turn to page four in the service bulletin. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel according to Mark chapter 11. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and he will send it back here without delay. They left and found a colt on the street tied at a door, and they untied it. Some who were standing there asked them, what are you doing untying that colt? The disciples answered them just as Jesus had instructed them, and the men let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus threw their garments on it, and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their garments on the road. Others spread branches that they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest! This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let us go forth in peace. You may be seated. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. The King of Glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. In all of Galilee, in city or village, he goes among his people, curing their illness. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. sin and death he truly has risen and he will share with us his heavenly kingdom the king of glory comes the nation rejoices open the gates before him lift up your voices please stand Dear friends in Christ, for five weeks of Lent, we have been preparing for the events of Holy Week. Today, we come together to begin this solemn celebration. Christ entered in triumph into his own city to complete his work as our Messiah, to suffer, to die, and to rise again. Let us remember with devotion his entry that culminated at the empty tomb and follow him with a lively faith. 
united with him by baptism, we share in his resurrection and new life. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As, we, as he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Exodus, chapter 12. We read a select portion of verses. These words will also serve as the basis for our sermon here this morning. The Lord told Moses and Aaron this in the land of Egypt. This month is to be the beginning of your calendar. It is to be the first month of the year for you. Tell the entire Israelite community that on the tenth day of this month, they are to take a lamb or a young goat for themselves, according to their father's households, one lamb per household. But if the household is too small for a whole lamb, then that person and his neighbor next door to him must select one, based on the number of people. Determine what size lamb is needed according to how much each person will eat. Your lamb must be unblemished, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the Israelite community is to slaughter the lambs at sunset. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat the lamb. That night they shall eat the meat that has been roasted over a fire, along with unleavened bread. They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Do not eat it raw or boiled in water but roasted over a fire, with its head, its legs, and its internal organs. You shall not leave any of it until the morning. Whatever remains until the morning, you shall burn in the fire. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, ready for travel, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take lambs for yourselves according to your family size, and slaughter the Passover lamb. You shall take a bundle of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and paint the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you are to go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord passes through to strike Egypt and sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike, to strike you. You shall observe these instructions as a perpetual regulation for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, just as he said he would, you shall observe this ceremony. So when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You will say, it is the sacrifice of the Passover to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. When he struck the Egyptians, he spared our houses. The people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites went and did all this, 
They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, even all the firstborn of the livestock. During the night, Pharaoh got up, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud outcry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not someone dead. This is the word of our God. We join together in the responsive reading of Psalm 24. Let the Lord enter. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. For he founded it upon the seas. And established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He will receive blessing from God the Savior. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. That the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors. That the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning. Is now and will be forever. Amen. Let the Lord enter. Our New Testament lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading verses 1 through 7. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And it is a kind of sexual immorality that not even the Gentiles practice. A man has his father's wife. Yet, you are proud. Shouldn't you have been filled with sorrow so that the man who did this deed would be removed from among you? Even though I am absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as one who is present, I have already decided about the man who has done such a thing. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and my spirit is there along with the power of our Lord Jesus, hand such a man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that the spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Purge out the old yeast, so that you may be a new batch, just as you are unleavened. For our Passover lamb has been sacrificed, namely, Christ. This is the word of our God. We confess our faith with a portion of the Athanasian Creed. It is furthermore necessary... For eternal salvation, truly to believe that our Lord Jesus Christ also took on human flesh. Now this is the true Christian faith. We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and man. He is God, eternally begotten from the nature of the Father, and He is man, born in time from the nature of His mother. Fully God, fully man, with rational soul and human flesh equal to the Father as to his deity, less than the Father as to his humanity. And though he is both God and man, Christ is not two persons, but one. One, not by changing the deity into flesh, but by taking the humanity into God. One, indeed, not by mixture of the natures, but by unity in one person. For just as the rational soul and flesh are one human being, so God and man are one Christ. He suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise with their own bodies to answer for their personal deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life, but those who have done evil will go into eternal fire. This is the true Christian faith. Whoever does not faithfully and firmly believe this cannot be saved. We continue with our next hymn.
to die. All Christ, your triumphs now begin. Poor captive death and conquered sin. Ride on, ride on in majesty, the angel armies of the sky. Look down with sad and wondering eyes to see the approaching sacrifice. Ride on, ride on in majesty, your last and fiercest strife is nigh. The Father on his Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the King of Israel. You know, I wonder if on that very first Palm Sunday, I wonder if those disciples looked at all that was going on and found themselves thinking to themselves, what a marvelous day. Finally, finally the Lord is getting the praise that he is due. Just listen to the people's hosannas. This, this is the way that it ought to be. But you know, as quickly as it started, It would have come to an end. Perhaps the children went off to play, the mothers and the fathers, the moms and the dads, off to prepare for the Passover. The duties of everyday life soon would make that morning parade a distant memory. For us today, too, Palm Sunday looks like such a glorious day. And while it is a great and glorious day in the life of our Savior Jesus Christ, it is also, at the very same time, a solemn day and a thought-provoking day. A day that we dare never forget. And we won't forget it. So long as we remember that the spotlight of this day is not on the cheering crowds in the palm-lined streets, but rather the focus is on the spotless Son of God as he comes into Jerusalem for the very last time. And as he enters into that holy city, we might be somewhat surprised at his reaction to the Palm Sunday crowd. For he receives all of this fanfare in solemn silence. The chants of the crowd say, Hosanna. And it reminds him of what he has come to do, for Hosanna means save now. It says it all. And Jesus knew just exactly what it was going to take to do just that. And so with his eye on the cross, Jesus enters into Jerusalem, intent on fulfilling his heavenly Father's will. He comes as the Passover Lamb of God, 
the one appointed by God himself. He comes to die. Now, 1,500 years earlier, God had made a covenant, that is a, a promise, with his Old Testament people, Israel. And it was a promise, it was a covenant that was sealed in the blood of a lamb. Its occasion was the last night that Israel would spend in slavery there in Egypt. On that night, God said that he would humble the nation of Egypt and their hard-hearted Pharaoh. On that night, God would go throughout the land of Egypt and he would strike down the firstborn of all the men and animals. It was the final of those ten plagues that he would bring about upon that nation and upon that Pharaoh who refused to listen to and acknowledge the Lord. And it was through his servant Moses that God told his people what he wanted them to do. He told them, I want you to select the very best lamb that you have, one without blemish, one without defect, one that is a year old in the prime of its life. And then I want you to slaughter it. I want you to paint the doorpost of your house with the blood of that lamb and stay inside your homes as you eat that sacred and that sacrificial lamb. That night, God himself would pass through the land of Egypt. He would bring tragedy and death upon all who were not protected by the blood of that lamb. The firstborn of every unmarked home would die. Only those homes where that blood of the lamb was visible would they be spared. There, the angel of death would pass over. Listen again as God relates this event. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take lambs for yourselves according to your family size and slaughter the Passover lamb. You shall take a bundle of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and paint the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you are to go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord passes through to strike Egypt and sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe these instructions as a perpetual regulation for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, just as he said he would, you shall observe this ceremony. So when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You will say, it is the sacrifice of the Passover to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. When he struck the Egyptians, he spared our houses. The people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites went and did all this. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, even all the firstborn of the livestock. During the night, Pharaoh got up. He, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud outcry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not someone dead. And in this remarkable way God delivered his people from bondage in Egypt and brought them into freedom and he wanted to make sure that the people would never forget what he had done and so he commanded them celebrate this year after year teach it to your children and never forget the lesson that is being taught the Lord alone can save in this annual festival it served its purpose well. For 1,500 years, it reminded God's people of this great deliverance from slavery in Egypt. But you see, this was not only supposed to be something that would remind them of this deliverance that took place in Egypt, but it also was to picture the greater deliverance that was to come. You see, it was a shadow of the cross. Each time that it was observed, it pointed ahead to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Today, the shadow of that Passover lamb has become 
a reality. What that Passover lamb could only have pictured, Christ has fulfilled. It's just as Paul said in our lesson, in that letter to the Corinthians, when he wrote, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And so you see, when we understand what is taking place here on this Palm Sunday, it's not so strange for us to be looking at the very first Passover on this Sunday. You see, God had commanded his people that they were to select that Passover lamb on the 10th of Nisan. They were supposed to take care of it for four days, and then four days later on the 14th, they would slaughter it at twilight. And now to put that into New Testament language, they were to select the lamb on Palm Sunday and sacrifice it on Monday, Thursday. And so as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he knows exactly what is taking place. God has chosen him to be the final Passover lamb. His father has appointed him to die for the sins of the world. He knows that he will go to the cross and that he will shed his blood there so that the wrath of God would pass over sinners. He knew that his father had chosen him to be the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And no other sacrifice would do. Only Jesus can be the perfect fulfillment of that Passover lamb. Because only Jesus is without sin and without blemish. Only Jesus can be the perfect offering for the sins of the world. Because only Jesus' blood is the holy, innocent blood of the divine Son of God. And so we see with this final week in Jesus' life the truth about our God. Our God is the one who brings about deliverance and salvation. And he leaves absolutely nothing to chance. Everything is taking place just according to his well-established plan. You see, when the, when the Israelites received these instructions for the very first time, they were still there in that slavery in Egypt. But soon, soon they were going to see that deliverance, that salvation that God would bring about as he would bring them out of that slavery. But that deliverance was only a picture of the far greater deliverance that would come about in Christ. In Jesus, the Passover reaches its climax, its conclusion, as the Lamb of God enters into Jerusalem and sacrifices himself on the altar of the cross. And while many in that first Palm Sunday crowd soon forgot about the excitement and the wonder of that, that day, we dare never forget. We dare never let the duties of everyday life cause this to be a distant and foggy memory. For that man entering into that city of Jerusalem, he's not some visiting celebrity. He's not just some curious miracle worker. He is our Savior and our King. He is truth and He is life. He is the only way to the Father. Oh, of course, our sinful nature, our sinful nature would love to get us to think that we don't really need him, that we can get along without him, that after all of these services of Holy Week are over, we can put him back onto that shelf until next year or until maybe some later time that we might need him. Our sinful nature would love to get us to think that we can coast through life without really ever having to think about sin and death and heaven and hell. It would like to get us to think that we can live by the motto, anything goes, and that repentance, well, that's for fools. All we really need to do is try our best. Yes, we live in a world, in a society, that wants us to think that people are basically good. 
And we would be absolutely fooling ourselves if we were to think that our sinful flesh does not find such a thought appealing. People have written books that say that hell isn't for real. People are taught, ah, oh, just simply follow your feelings and your heart. Don't worry about what the word has to say. Sin is downplayed and considered to be minor. But you see, the Passover lamb then and now, it teaches us a far different reality, doesn't it? We are not basically good people who just happen to be trapped in an unjust society. We are by nature corrupt sinners living in a godless society. The yeast of sin, it lives in and remains in all of us. And no matter how dedicated you are to your creed, no matter how much time you spend in church or how many offices you hold, no matter how much you give to your congregation, we cannot work off our sin. We cannot pay its debt. Sin corrupts, sin ruins, and sin sentences us to hell. The only way that sin can be done away with is by Jesus paying for it at the cross. And dear Christian friends, that is exactly what he did. There he suffered for those outward sins that we commit on a regular basis and the sins of the heart that only God sees. He wiped our guilt away forever and now we are free from hell, free from guilt because God has declared each and every one of us not guilty. He has declared us innocent through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And by the faith that he works in us, we believe that everything Jesus did has been done for us and counts for us. And so in the shadow of the Passover lamb, we see Jesus who has freed us from the power of sin. Of course, for us, and it's just like each of these Sundays that we've been looking at throughout this sermon series, The Shadows of the Cross, for us, as we stand on this side of the Old Testament, we, of course, we see things a whole lot more clearly, don't we? We see that Christ comes into Jerusalem not to receive the fanfare of the crowd. He comes to deliver, to save, to die. And for this very reason, we rightfully say Palm Sunday is part of Jesus' passion. Jesus is being led to the slaughter in order to satisfy the justice of God. All of this was part of God's plan to deliver the sinner and to do it through the blood of the Lamb. And dear friends, where that blood of Jesus Christ is sprinkled onto the doorpost of the heart by faith, well, there we find the greatest freedom from the worst bondage ever. For in Christ and his blood, we find the forgiveness of sins, deliverance from the power of death and the devil, and salvation. For the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The Passover lamb has come to take away the sin of the world, to take away your sins and mine. He comes into Jerusalem and he does not look back. Indeed, dear Christian friends, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Indeed, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. We'll guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me.
Lord Jesus, you are the king of heaven and earth. We join the first Palm Sunday worshipers in praising and glorifying you for coming to this earth to be our Savior. We thank you for living a life of perfect conformity to God's holy law in our place. We praise you for being obedient to death, even death on a cross, to redeem us from sin. Cause our voices to blend with those who sang your praises as you rode into Jerusalem. Move us to confess you before others as our Lord. Use us to assure all people that your blood has cleansed them from sin and set them free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil. Who us to dedicate all we are and have to your glory. Lord Jesus, you are king over all the earth. Bless the nations of this world with wise rulers and good government. Let peace prevail. Grant success to the business and industries of our land so that they might serve the common good. Cause all employers to be honest and fair-minded, and all employees to be diligent and faithful. Look with favor on our nation's schools. Be with those who teach and those who learn. Comfort the sick and the afflicted with the assurance of your care and protection, and strengthen the faith of the dying. Dear Savior, as we walk with you this week toward Calvary, keep us focused on your purpose for coming into this world and on our calling to spread this wonderful message of salvation. Hear us for your mercy's sake. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. be seated. Zanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sang through pillared court and temple, the lovely anthem rang to Jesus who had blessed them, close folded to his breast. The children sang their praises, the simplest and the best. They followed mid an exultant crowd, the victor palm branch waving and chanting clear and loud. scorn that little children should on his fitting wait. In the highest that ancient song we sing, for Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven.
and our King. Praise Him with heart and life and voice. Nothing happens by chance. As we have looked over these last six weeks and seen the shadows of the cross that our, our Lord put right there into the, into the Old Testament, we see that from the moment that sin entered into this world, God's plan, God's desire, has been to save you. And he has done that through his son, Jesus Christ. The final Passover lamb. There he comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, knowing full well what lay in store for him, and yet willingly going to that cross to suffer our punishment, to endure our hell, and to win our forgiveness. Through him, and through him alone, we are indeed forgiven. And by faith, the blood of that Passover lamb of our Savior Jesus Christ is indeed painted, sprinkled on our hearts so that the wrath of God passes over us because of the work that Christ has done on our behalf. God's richest blessings to you as you continue to focus on that truth, not just this week during Holy Week, not just Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, but that, that focus remains your focus throughout your entire life until we join with all the saints around the throne of the Lamb in heaven singing Hosanna in the highest. A joy to worship with all of you here this morning. The announcements you find there in your service bulletin, I will try to draw your attention to just a couple other ones. First of all, if you do not receive the newsletter by means of email, um, please do grab a newsletter and a calendar on your way out. If you are visiting with us today and would like one of those, you are certainly welcome to take one as well. Also then, please take note of the services that will be taking place this week. Monday, Thursday, this Thursday, will be a 6.30 service here in Black River Falls. Good Friday, a 6.30 service here in Black River Falls. And then Easter Sunday, next week, Monday, excuse, next week, Monday, next week, Sunday, with breakfast um, at, um, after the service. The service will be at 8 o'clock in, in the morning there on Easter Sunday. Then also, please take note that um, we will once again be having our um, tomb, live tomb display. And there is still... Plenty of spots open if somebody would like to and is willing to um, be a guard for that tomb between the end of the Good Friday service until Easter Sunday morning. There is a sign-up sheet hanging on the bulletin board which can be found as you make your way to the bathrooms. And then the last announcement would simply be that aspect. There is still a sign-up sheet sitting on the white table in the gathering area also concerning Easter breakfast and any foods that might be needed yet for Easter breakfast. Um, I believe that touches on everything or most everything. Everything else, please look at there in the service bulletin. God's richest blessings to you. We will also watch our Wells Connection this morning as well.
At first glance, Luther Prep looks much like any top-tier high school, with quality instruction, state-of-the-art classrooms, and a full slate of extracurriculars. Right now, I'm doing I'm an RA in dorms. They're studying all. I've got to the ball play. I'm playing football. I'm doing prep singers. I mean, I'm able to do all of that at the same time while also being around Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the connection to Jesus that sets this school apart. Because LPS is designed to be a key step in a lifetime of service to God's people. A mission that's been unchanged for 155 years. And I think that's what, like, what's, what makes our synod special because you see a consistency there and you see the same faith and you see the same passion for the gospel. Because the students here come from all over the country and the world, most live in dormitories on campus. That might seem like a hardship, but it actually fosters maturity and builds even stronger ties between parents and children. You will actually feel that you are closer to your child after the prep experience and closer to your child for the rest of his or her life. My faith has grown so much that I can have these higher level conversations with them about my God and thoughts that I'm having. Living on campus also builds deeper friendships with like-minded young people who encourage each other in their Christian faith. It's a truly incredible experience. You'll see, you'll see not only uh, your faith growing, you'll be able to see the faith within your friends growing too, which is an incredible thing to witness. It just makes it so much easier to be away, and like then you don't even realize that God, and it's just this becomes the home basically. Previously, the place of worship that forced back the prime. In a world that seems especially unstable this school year, it's comforting to know that the next generation of pastors, teachers, and staff ministers are as committed as ever to bringing the gospel of Christ to a world in need. They realize there are a lot of things going on in the world right now that show even greater than need that, that we have for a certain <coughs> that need for people to go proclaim Christ publicly in the classroom or the pulpit will always be there. It's just very evident today. Currently, students at Luther Prep come from 25 states and six countries. Diversity that adds to our strength as we reach out in Jesus' name to people across cultures and around the world. With more than 400 students, Luther Prep's enrollment remains strong, preparing a new generation of faithful leadership for our congregations and schools.